We're not taking these outside of the Bhagavatam separately. We understood and appreciated the Sambandha Gyan of the first nine cantos. This will build our Shraddha. Shraddha Shabde Vishwasa Khoi Dhrita Nishchaya Krishna Bhakti Koile Sarva Karma Krita Khaya That this Shraddha when is one's confidence and firm faith that by following this process of devotion described in the early cantos then one is sure to achieve fulfillment of all his desires. So it's imperative to appreciate all of Srimad Bhagavatam. And the Srimabhyasade in the first canto, principally, previously he just gave Gyankand and Karmakand in his writings in the Puranic writings. But in the first canto, it was revealed to him in trance, this um, remarkable sweet aspect, this Madhurya aspect of Krishna. And the crest jewel of the entire Bhagavatam is actually Krishna's Rasalina. But to really become qualified or to feel that enthusiasm purely, then one must be purified of these various lower tendencies. So this will happen naturally by going through the first nine cantos. It's not, there's no Acharya who has encouraged that we jump straight into the sweet, <coughs> charming waters of the twelfth, of the tenth canto. And it's also described in the um, 33rd chapter of that 10th canto, Vikrini tam brajavadubi itam cha vishnu shradan vito nushrun yad artha dharanyadya bhaktim param bhagavati pratilabhya karma pridroga masab apinoti akcharena dira. That when we hear these topics attentively and carefully, from the lips of the pure devotees and under guidance from the pure sadhus. Then we can speak these topics. And by speaking these topics, we will remember these topics. Shravana, Kirtana, Vishnu, Smaranam, Shravana, hearing first, then Kirtana, speaking, and then remembering. So by hearing all these sweet pastimes, try to appreciate that if you can um, remember them for your own progress in bhaja and also to speak these pastimes. Hopefully all of you hearing these pastimes when you go away, you will also find or look for or pray for an opportunity at some point to speak these pastimes to others, even just to children, speak these pastimes. It will be very enlivening for you and for the people hearing. So try to think of it like this. These Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svaranam. So we are hearing in this sense. We're hearing aspects of the Bhagavatam, but in its entirety. And as Srila Lule was just saying on the lecture, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he came to describe what is Parakya Bhav, what is Unnata Ujvala, the teaching of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is described in the 10th canto. And we are approaching those most esoteric, sweet topics of the affection that the gopis have for Krishna. Our path is one of love. If it's not love, then it's fear. What is fear? Fear is vaidhi mark. Fear that if I don't perform the rules and regulations, I won't get the result. And expectancy that if I do perform 
the rules and regulations, then I will have resolved. It's a different dynamic. It's about my getting something from Sri Krishna. It's not pure, unadulterated pretty or love for Krishna. It doesn't have that um, appreciation of that spontaneity. And remember, as I've said previously, that this was never there before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prior to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, this mood, that Madhurya was there, but very selective. Jaidev Goswami, Vichasakadi, etc. A few personalities understood this, but none of them really had the understanding of Parakya Bhav. This could only be explained directly by Mahaprabhu. And we have that opportunity. So working through these early chapters of the Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's childhood pastimes, it's building a platform again within the 10th canto. For what? To enter into Venu Geet, enter in, into Gopi Geet, to enter into these topics of the Rasalila topics. Because without an appreciation of these topics, how will you go forward? How will you go forward with any genuine affection? You'll be going forward with an idea, probably of just wanting moksha, liberation from the various difficulties in this world. But our object is to go forward with great enthusiastic affection to try and build that attachment and attraction to Krishna, from asakti to bhav, and then ultimately to prema bhakti. So, so far we've discussed Putana. How old was Putana? How old was Krishna? <laughs> Three to six days. And the next demon, who was the next demon? Shaka to Sura. How old was Krishna? Three months. Yes. And the next demon? Trina Brata. And how old was Krishna? One year. One year. And the next um, demonic influence, we can say, or what Krishna had to purify? Nala Kubera and Mani Griva. Yes, so Krishna was about one and a half years then. It's very good that we go through like this, so we fix in our minds a remembrance of the sequence. According to his ages, if we always base the thread on his ages, then we can very easily have the demons, pastimes, at our fingertips. So after Nala Kubera and Mani Griva comes Vasasura. And now Krishna is out cow grazing and he's in the region of Govardhan Hill. He's come from Chatikara and he's come all the way out to Govardhan. And then after Vatsasura is Bakasura. Bakasura. And this is in another region close by Govardhan. And then after Bakasura, when Krishna is on the cusp of his Poganda age is Agasura. Agasura is a huge demon, heavy duty, big demon. <clears throat> and then um, he was actually killed just on the other side, the back side, towards Kamban, because the next Leela, Brahma Vimohan Leela, takes place in Vatsavan. Vatsavan is near Kamyaban. So, remember the geography. And um, now, after the Brahma Vimohan Leela, is Krishna's age then dramatically comes to the Poganda age. And then I describe Krishna is now taking out the cows, no longer the calves. And it's described his chest is broader, his nape waist is narrow, his feet are bigger. So many descriptions of his beautiful Poganda body, his beautiful Poganda form that's manifesting at this time. So then after this very ferocious demon, <coughs> then um, some time later it's described that Balade Prabhu is having another festival in honor of his appearance there. So Mother Rohini is keeping him at home. And where the boys have planned to go is near the lake of Kaliya, Kaliya Krida. 
This lake, understand clearly, it's described as being in the Jumuna. But what does that mean? If it was directly in the Jumuna, then all the residents of Matura, etc., would suffer the poisonous effects in their water and so on. So it's not directly. It is in the Jumuna, but it's in a side lake from the Jumuna. In Australia, they call them billabongs. It's like a, a side river, so to speak, and it's created a whole, like, stagnant lake. So Kalia has taken residence. We'll discuss that history and why he's there um, after the pastime, because that's the next chapter. We've reached chapter 16, by the way. So if you keep um, focus on the numbers of the chapters also, it's very helpful. How we're proceeding <coughs> through this 10th canto. Remember the 32 chapters just about brush, 40 chapters about Dwarka, all within the 10th canto. So constantly be appreciating the entirety of the Bhagavatam, because this understanding is, is like a jewel. It's a beautiful jewel, and there's different aspects to the jewel, and they all create the one very sublime impression or sweetness of that jewel. So it's all connected. Don't separate anything. So now, Baladev, being the elder brother of Krishna, tells Krishna, Oh, my dear brother, don't go to the Kaliya Krida lake. The great demon Kaliya is there. Baladev knows his brother. He's <laughs> very restless. But he tells him directly, don't go. So then what does Krishna do when he's out cow grazing the cows? He immediately goes to the Kaliya Krida lake. And as he's going to the lake, he's thinking, my elder brother, Baladev, told me not to come to this lake, but still, I'm going to go anyway. So he goes. And the boys, they all run ahead of Krishna. And it's described that this is in summertime. And it's hot. And they all immediately drink the water of that lake. This lake is eight miles wide. That's a big lake. That's the distance from today, from Vrindavan to Mathura, is about eight miles. So it's a big, big lake where Kali lives, with all his wives and children, etc. So then the um, <laughs> suckers, they drink that water, and the cows drink that water, and they all die, apparently. They are eternal Nitya Siddha Parikas, so ultimately they can't die. But still, for the Leela, it appears that they're dead. And then Krishna, who is thinking, these personalities are dearer to me than my own life. They have given up absolutely everything for me. They know nothing except me. And then it's a very beautiful description in Gopal Champu, how Krishna goes from boy to boy, personally, and embraces and brings back, revives their consciousness of each boy. He embraces each particular boy. And then after the first 8, 10, 12 boys, and each time he spends a long time embracing each boy and bringing him back to consciousness. And then it's described that he expands to embrace all the other boys for a long time, bringing them back to consciousness. And then he also embraces all the cows and brings them back to consciousness. So this is the sweetness, the beauty. This is Madhurya Bhav. This has a whole other dimension to what we previously discussed in the first night canto. We come to a whole other land. This is the spiritual land. This is the land of Gokul. This is the pure spiritual kingdom, the reality that we're aspiring to achieve or to return at some time. We've never been there, but still, it's in a sense of returning to our original nature in the spiritual world. So, then the cows and the cowherd boys, they become revived, their consciousness is revived. And then Krishna, he becomes a little restless at this point and he decides, I'm not going to let Kaliya pollute my Jamuna anymore. And then he decides to chastise Kaliya. All around the lake, because of the intensity of the boiling fumes and vapors that are rising from this lake, 
it's described that even if a bird flies across the lake, it'll choke by the vapors and poison and drop into the lake and die. And it's described that all around the vegetation has been completely killed. There's no living vegetation around because of the poison of the waters. But there's one particular Kadamba tree, which we see and visit every year in Brudge. And this Kadamba tree, what was the reason? Why was it alive? Because Garuda, Garuda stood on that tree when he was carrying a pot of nectar. And a drop of that nectar touched the tree, just so Krishna could perform this remarkable pastime. This is going to be the most amazing pastime that Krishna is about to perform. This really, the Brahma Vimohan Leela was incredible. But this next Leela is even more so. Really, it takes the whole consideration to a whole other level. So then Krishna, he looks at his beautiful Sakas and he thinks with some anger, I will chastise Kaliya. So then he climbs this tree, the only tree living in the, in the area, and it's a strike, he tightens his belt, pulls his hair back, puts it in a knot at the back, and he slaps his arms like a wrestler, going to challenge. And then he plunges into this Kaliya Krida, this lake of Kaliya. But what is it that's actually entering the lake? This is the entirety of the Brahman Krishna carries in his stomach. So we can imagine the amount of effect it had on this lake. There were towering waves. It's described as a hundred hands high. The lakes, the, the, the waves that were caused by Krishna diving into that lake. Huge. So this immensity of Krishna's body, even though he's in the body of a tiny small child, but still the effect was incredible. Then it's described that the waves, they go back into the vegetation. The cowherd suckers there on a little bit raised, raised place. But all the waves also flood. And then Krishna begins the most ecstatic music. He starts creating music with his hands. Like when you slap the water, you can get different sound vibrations. So he's slapping the water with his hands and his arms. And sometimes he's kicking with his feet. But it's Krishna. So he's making an incredible musical sound. And all the neighbors are just astonished what is happening. And then Krishna creates this sound more and more and more. And then Krishna, it's described by Shukadeva Goswami, begins to roar very loudly, actually calling for Kaliya. And Kaliya is aware of this disturbance in his leg. He's considering, of course, it's his leg. And who has dared enter my lake? And then Kaliya, raising his, he has 101 prominent hoods and a thousand other hoods. And he comes out with his hoods, eyes blazing like fire. And what does he see? He sees the absolute beauty of Sri Krishna. He sees his sweet petal like lotus eyes. He sees his soft body, delicate body. It's even described that he sees his lotus feet, his beautiful lotus feet. He sees his shining yellow goatee. Kaliya sees he has direct darshan of Krishna. But it's described by Shukadeva Goswami that his envious, wicked nature overpowers this sense of appreciating Krishna's beauty. And what does he do? In rage, he reaches forward and he bites Krishna's chest. <coughs> and Krishna allows himself to be wrapped in the huge coils of Kaliya Naga. Naga means snake. Of Kaliya Naga. And at that time, it's described that the boys on the bank, or the gopas, they faint in such fear. But Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur describes, this is not the suckers who are fainting. The suckers don't even have the energy or ability to faint. Their eyes are just focused on Krishna in absolute shock. These other persons who faint, they're the gopas who came to the lake 
to warn the boys not to go in the lake. But it's not the cowherd suckers themselves who actually faint. So the boys are there in total shock. And the cows also, they can't cry anymore. It's described that fear has dried up their tears. This snake is so ferocious with his so many hoods in an eight mile size lake. He practically takes up half the lake with his body. He's really an intimidating personality. So he wraps Krishna around in his coils. And now the devas are really horrified. Even though they know, because they're all like Jnani Bhaktas, they all understand Krishna's ultimate Aishwarya. Krishna <coughs> in a second can kill this little snake. But still, they're caught up in the Leela, and they're very much intimidated also by um, Kalyan at that time. So what do they do? They manifest different sorts of bad omens in the village of Braj. Because the demigods are also thinking that, oh, Nanda Baba and Balade and the rest of the Brijbasis, they can come and support Krishna. They will come and help defeat Kaliya. So they manifest earthquakes in Braj. They manifest in the sky many meteorites. <coughs> and they manifest in the bodies of men shivering on the left hand side. Shivering on the left hand side for a man is very inauspicious. If your right side trembles, a man, you should know that is auspicious. For a lady, for a woman, if her left side <coughs> shivers, then that is auspicious. So they manifested for the women of Braj shivering on their right side. And they manifested for the men of Braj shivering on their left side. The bridge masters at this moment were about to sit down and take a huge feast that had been prepared in Balade's honor. <coughs> all the preparations had been caught. They were all ready just to take this prashadam. Magnificent prashadam, <laughs> special day. But when these signs manifested in Braj, what was their very first thought? Because they're continually thinking of Krishna. This is our process. When we follow in the wake of the Radha devotees, this, these are the Radha Atmikas. Their Atma is soaked in Rag. We are Radha Anugas. Our process is to follow them. These descriptions are of the bridge buses for us to try and appreciate the love that the bridge, the focused, absolute love. They have given their entirety to Krishna. So even though they're just about to be offered a feast, when these omens manifest, their first thought is Krishna's safety. And then they are also very fearful because Baladev Prabhu didn't go with Krishna that day. And when Baladev sees the fear in the Brijvasis, it's described by Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur. The Brijvasis are just about to leave their bodies out of fear. That's how terrified they've become. So Baladev Prabhu steps forward and smiles beautifully, reassuring the Brijvasis of Krishna's potency, his power. And when the Brijvasis see Baladev smile, then they realize that actually if we left our bodies now, Krishna would feel such separation. So they can't leave their bodies because they realize that Krishna is going to miss them. They have this mood that Krishna is dependent on us. <coughs> Appreciate the dynamic. We're talking about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We're talking about Lord Narayan. We're talking about the highest principle of love and affection. This is what these pastimes are all bringing to light. For our benefit, to follow this path of Radhamara. This is the purpose to give us this insight into the Brijabhasi's sweetness. So then when the Brijabhasi's decide not to leave their bodies or realize that they are still 
there within their bodies, then immediately it's described all of the village of Raj. The youngest children and the oldest men and women, they immediately start to run to the path which goes to the Jamuna to look for Krishna. But Krishna has millions of cows and they're all making cow hoof marks on the trail. But the Brijbasis, due to their tremendous affection, can only see the lotus foot marks of Sri Krishna. That chakra, gold, barley corn, uh, lotus, etc. Only Krishna. They're actually seeing, and it's described by the Acharyas like a yogi who's focused so intently on his goal, he's not looking at any other distractions. So all the bridge buses are in this. It's not that one or two bridge buses are just looking. They are all intensely unified in their desire to quickly help Krishna. Krishna is in trouble, obviously. Otherwise, these inauspicious elements wouldn't have happened. So they all, the whole village, comes to the village. <coughs> And it's described that to their horror, they see that Krishna is wrapped up in these coils of this huge naga, this huge snake. Now understand one thing, the rich Vasis themselves have never seen Krishna with a demon. They saw him on the breast of Putana once she was dead. They saw him on the chest of Trinavrata when he was dead. They never saw him defeat Vatsasura. They never saw him defeat Avasura or Denukasura or Bhagasura. They never saw this. They only heard about this. This is the first demon they ever seen with Krishna. It's like something happens to them. They become totally like traumatized by the magnitude of this demon. And then it's described that straight away, without any hesitation, Mother Yashoda, she wants to go straight into this poison lake. And then all the elder gopas, elder gopis, they hold her back. And they start to tell Mother Yashoda about the greatness of Krishna, even though they're terrified themselves. But they're telling Mother Yashoda, it's all right, we know that Krishna is actually very powerful. Be pacified. It'll be. They don't. They can't really do it in a convincing way. So Mother Yashoda, she passes out. She faints, and then she comes back to life again and sees the horror, and again she faints. And then Nanda Baba and the Gopas, of course, they will solve the problem, and they choose to enter this lake. But then Baladev, he now in Poganda age, he's more like a man. He stands barring their way, smiling beautifully. Oh, don't you know the power of my younger brother? Hasn't Garga Muni told you all that he's not different to Lord Narayan? He has the same qualities. Have faith. Have confidence in my younger brother's ability to defeat this demon. And he's smiling so beautifully with his <coughs> omniscience. And the elder Gopas, they're somewhat pacified. But all are traumatized. Meanwhile, the Gopis, the young Gopis, whose love at this point has become very serious towards Krishna. It's described there Purvarag. This Purvarag is an anticipation of meeting with Krishna. They haven't really met in a conjugal way yet. But they've met with Krishna many times. Of course, since they were two years old, one years old, joking and playing like that. But now with this Purvarag, all the gopis see is void. They only see just emptiness all around. They're totally aghast. It's described that Krishna remains in these coils for one muhurta, which is 48 minutes. So the whole pastime that I've just described from the inauspicious omens to this point has taken 48 minutes for them to reach from their village to the Jamuna and to have this traumatic experience of seeing their darling, the center of their entire existence in such a dangerous condition. And then Krishna realizes, okay, I've pushed them enough. They cannot tolerate any more of this extreme mood of anxiety forming. So then he 
starts to expand his body. And Kalia, he feels this expanding little body. So it, it's hurting Kalia's body as Krishna expands. Kalia is trying to keep his grip, but he can't. Krishna expands, and eventually he just becomes very small again and jumps out of the coils. <coughs> now it's described by Srila Krishna Chakravarti Thakur that during this time, while Kalia was holding Krishna in his coils, he moved to one like sandbank or island within that Kalia Krita. There was something of an island actually within that lake. And then Kaliya Krita has actually moved to that island. So Krishna, he jumps out of the coils. And then he starts to circle around Kaliya, running very fast. Kaliya all the time is trying to shoot his flames and vomit and smoke at Krishna and trying to consume him with his, the heat of his poison. And Krishna is running around so quickly. Kaliya becomes so bewildered. And after some time, Kaliya starts to become tired by chasing this little boy who's running so much faster than he can actually move his head. And when Krishna realizes that his, he's becoming a little tired, then it's described that he pushes <coughs> down these very broad serpentine hoods of Kaliya. He pushes one down. And then to everyone's amazement, he jumps on top of that hood. And I've described that Kaliya has 101 prominent hoods. So then Krishna, with his beautiful, delicate lotus feet glowing with the red jewels of Kaliya's in his forehead. Snakes, they have jewels in their forehead. It's like describing in the lower planetary regions, there is no sunlight. There is only the light coming from the jewels of an undershesh that illumine the lower worlds. All snakes, they have these jewels in their foreheads. So these jewels are illuminating the sweetness of Krishna's lotus feet. And then to everyone's amazement, he begins to dance. He pulls out his flute and he's playing a song and he begins to dance on the hoods of Kaliya. But... <coughs> As I said in the beginning, Krishna holds the whole Brahman in his abdomen. So when he's jumping from one hood to the next, he crashes down on Kaliya's head with the whole Brahman behind his weight. And Kaliya is just getting smashed. And he's jumping from one hood to another, playing the most incredible music. And immediately he starts playing the music. All the devas in the heavenly planets immediately come. The Gandavas, the Charanas, the Sages, the Siddhas, they all come to accompany Krishna's music. Krishna is described as Natavara, the master of dancers. Shivji is Nataraj. He's only the king of dancers. Krishna is the master of dancers. So when Krishna begins to dance, everyone is astonished. And then the devas, they try to keep up with the intricacy of Krishna's musical delivery. The devas, they can't keep up with Krishna's ragas that he's playing. They're just astonished. And in the end, they just, just start crying. They can't keep up the musical accompaniment because it's so involved, it's so, in, it's so special, it's so beautiful, because Krishna's dance is so beautiful. His dance has to fit the music. The raga has to fit the way that he's dancing. So Krishna, he's understanding his next moves, so he's playing the ragas accordingly. But the devas don't know that, and they can't keep up with his accompaniment. This is described by um, Kavi Kanpur in his Ananda Vrindavan Chakra. There's many instances where Kavi Kanpur describes musical abilities, particularly in the Spring Holy Festival. And obviously his understanding of music is very high. So he describes all this pattern of music. Now at this time, the gopis, whose hearts have seriously, very seriously developed so much anura, praying for Krishna, then they are witnessing this hero of all time, this Natavara, dancing so extraordinary. 
on these hoods. And this is described by many of the acharyas. This is the first time the gopis have ever seen Krishna dancing like this. And Krishna is indicating to them with his eye glances, soon you and me will dance like this together on the night of the Ras Lila. He's indicating this. Watch the speciality of my moves so you can learn them, so you can become qualified when you're dancing in the Ras Lila. So we will all dance in such excellent uh, manner in the uh, night of that Ras Lila. So now, <coughs> gradually, gradually, Kaliya is becoming more and more exhausted by the pressure of Krishna landing on each of his hoods. And slowly, slowly, his flames and vapor is turning to blood and vomit. He's starting to really understand who is this person that is dancing on my hoods. He's understanding this can only be Lord Narayan or Vishnu. Previously, his brother is Garuda. They are both sons of Kashyapa Muni. <coughs> Kashyapa Muni had many, many <coughs> wives. He married the 13 daughters of Daksha. And um, Kaliya's mother is called Kadu. Kadru. Kadru. Kadru, his mother, daughter of Daksha. And um, Garuda's mother is Vinata. They were both co-wives. There's a whole Puranic Leela about their differences of uh, moods towards each other. But basically Garuda was very much an enemy of Kaliya, even though they were brothers. So when um, Kaliya understands that this is someone much, much greater than Garuda, much greater than anyone I've ever experienced, it must be Lord Vishnu or Lord Narayan. And at this point, he begins demonstrating what's called Sanchari Bhavs of astonishment for that transcendental personality. And these Bhavs are what the Nagapatnis immediately see. Nagapatnis are the wives of Kaliya. Kaliya has many, many wives. And they are all Bhaktas. They are all devotees of Lord Narayan, Krishna. And they understand with Aishwarya mood, actually, that this is non-different to Lord Narayan. And at this time, they see their husbands to Krishna. They've been trying to tell their husband Kaliya to surrender to Krishna for a lifetime. But Kaliya hasn't done that. He hasn't listened to his good wives. So then the Nagapatnis, they come forward when they witness the Sanchari Bhavs coming from Kaliya. And they put their small sons in front because they're also somewhat intimidated by Krishna. They know that Krishna must be that Supreme Personality. So they're not sure that Krishna is going to fulfill their desire of releasing Kaliya. So they come forward in a very submissive mood, hoping Krishna will be endeared by their dear sons. So they're putting their sons in front and then they're offering obeisances. Now, there's a description of 23 verses here where the Nagapandis, they glorify that Supreme Person. When Srila Gurudev was translating this pastime into Hindi, he was talking, I think we were in America somewhere, maybe Miami or somewhere like that, he was talking many times about what were the Nagapandis think, what is the nature of their affection, what is the nature of their love. He got really involved in the prayers of the Nagapatnis. They're very, very beautiful prayers. And we can read them in this 16th chapter. And there's 23 verses of them. So Shukadeva Goswami is bringing out this mood of, it's actually like Aishwarya, just like the wives of the Brahmanas. They also had this background of Aishwarya Bhav. But they're bringing it into brush. So it's a special dynamic that is actually happening here. And we've talked before about the differences between Aishwarya and Madhurya. So we're seeing this somewhat overlapping here to some degree. It's still Madhurya because Krishna hasn't changed his form. He's still a little boy. He hasn't gone sitting on a regal throne like Lord Narayan. So it's still utterly Madhurya. Then they glorify Krishna so sweetly. They glorify Krishna. Krishna's heart melts. And he decides at this point to allow Kaliya to keep his life heirs. 
Kalia's whole body is actually broken. All his bones are aching, his muscles are completely gone. Actually, they're saying even before he was fit to be killed, but now he has the imprints of your feet. I think now you should eat him. Very beautiful. Before they were saying the wise were so fed up with Kalia, he should have been killed. But now we've seen in his heart, he's actually surrendering to you. Not only that, he has your lotus footprints on his head. How can that not be an incredible speciality? So then, for these reasons, many reasons, we can read these verses. Then Krishna's heart softens and melts and he jumps down from Kaliya onto that island. And at that time, Kaliya tries to prostrate himself on the ground to offer dandavas. But he can't because his body is aching so much. So many of his bones are broken. He's really being smashed thoroughly by the weight of the Brahma on his head, heads. So it's described he's getting down in like a crippled way. And he's starting to give nice prayers to Krishna at this point. And then um, Krishna, by his mercy, he touches Kaliya. And immediately all of Kaliya's wounds and afflictions are healed just by that touch of Krishna. And then Krishna directs Kaliya. Now you must return to Ramanaka, that island near Fiji. Uh, the seaport, Indian Sea, around Fiji. Pacific Ocean, yeah, that island in the Pacific. It's near Fiji. Ramanaka is the name of the island. Now you can return to that island. But then Kaliya, he says, but Garuda will probably attack me again. Why was Garuda even attacking his brother? This is the history that's described in the 17th chapter, the next chapter, because Parikshit Maharaj asks this question. So it's described there that on this island, Garuda would come regularly and a bird's food is snakes. So he would take the small snakes from that island and then all the snakes had a meeting and they offered Garuda a truce. They said, look, if we collect much nice foodstuffs for you, then will you just take that foodstuffs rather than be eating us periodically so we're not living in fear all the time? And then Garuda very magnanimously agreed that yes, he would just eat those offerings that they offered him. But Kalia was so arrogant because of his mighty strength. If someone is so strong, it can often lead to arrogance if that strength is not dovetailed in service to Krishna. So Kaliya's strength was not being dovetailed. So he became very arrogant. And he thought, who is this Garuda anyway? I will eat the offerings. So Kaliya was eating these offerings that was meant for Garuda. And then the other snakes, because they wanted to save their own lives, they told Garuda, oh, do you know who's eating all these? We're making these offerings, but this Kaliya, he's eating them all. So then when Garuda heard that, he immediately raced towards Kaliya. And Kaliya put up something of a fight with Garuda. Garuda is the carrier of Lord Vishnu. He is like enormous. He can like fly through so many planetary systems. He's like enormous, huge bird. But Kaliya put up a fight with him. But then at one point in the fight, then Garuda just slams him with his wing. And he completely like knocks him out. And then Kaliya, he realizes, I have to escape Garuda. And then he has heard that there was one great sage meditating in the Jamuna, Subhara Rishi. And he made a curse towards Garuda. Garuda was fishing, which again is the food of a bird in the Jamuna. And he took some fish from the Jamuna and the sage Subhara Rishi, he was seeing this bird and he saw because Subhara Rishi had been under the water for so long, he had connected with the community of the fish. And when some of those fishes were taken out by Garuda, all the other fishes of course were very afraid and very disturbed. So they beseeched Subhara, can you make some arrangement to stop this bird coming in, this big bird coming in and take, eating us? So then, Garu uh, Subhara Rishi requested Garuda, don't come into this lake anymore. But Garuda didn't listen to that. And again he came and took more fish 
from that lake. And at this time, Subari Rishi is described, he cursed Garuda. If you ever come again to this lake, you will die. I curse you to die if you take any more fish. Garuda, of course, is not actually affected by such a curse of a lower entity. Garuda is a very special personality. But, nevertheless, he respected that curse of Subaru Rishi. And we know that later Subaru Rishi fell down because he disrespected this great parika of Lord Narayan, this great personality, because he disrespected Garuda. And he cursed Garuda for this. He thought he was just an ordinary bird. So for this offense, Sabari Rishi, later on, he saw two fish, we were hearing, was it last night? Yeah. Um, were copulating in front of him, and then a lusty desire rose in his heart. He came out of that Jamuna, all encrusted with uh, shells, etc. And then he went to request these 50 beautiful daughters from one king, and all the daughters were horrified. So then he mystically arranged himself and looked like a beautiful man. And then all the daughters of the king wanted to marry him because he was looking so beautiful. So then he manifested himself as 50 different forms to marry these 50 daughters. And then for some time he lived, it's described by Srila Vishnu Chakrari Thakur, in the hell of family life. <laughs> That's not Nothing opulent or special about being a king with 50 wives. Hell is existence. So, uh, Kaliya, he very humbly petitions Krishna, how will I now avoid the fearful um, blows of Garuda? And Krishna at this time says, because my feet have marked your hoods, Garuda will never again approach you like this. But now, cure this brutal nature. When you come in contact even with a little bit of Krishna consciousness, initially, even just hearing that first sound vibration of the Hare Krishna mantra, your lower demonic tendencies start to leave. And gradually our process is that these demonic natures automatically become submerged by the higher nature of our pure Atma in service to Krishna. So similarly, Guru, um, Kaliya's nature, seeing Darshan directly of Krishna, how could his cruel and brutal nature maintain any prominence in his consciousness? It was purified. Kaliya was purified by that darshan and connection with Krishna. Not only that, of course, by having the lotus feet of Krishna directly placed on his foot. So after this time, Kaliya actually becomes a great devotee. And it's described by Sanatana Goswami in his Brihad Bhagavan Rita right at the end that actually Kaliya would become the chariot where Krishna would go to Mathura for that Kamsa's uh, arena to actually and kill Kulyapiri, etc. That whole Mathura Pasa. He would travel on Kaliya. This is another day of Lord Brahma. So then, after Kaliya had become pacified, um, and not fearful anymore of Garuda. Then all the Nagapatnis, they came and they began putting beautiful ointments on the body of Krishna. And they began massaging his limbs and giving so many beautiful jewels and garlands and clothes. They had a huge treasury. Snakes, they hoard things. So they had a huge treasury of jewels, etc. And they were offering everything to Krishna. And at this time, it's described very remarkably, that when Krishna dived into the lake, he, his Kastuma money, his jewel, actually came off during that dancing performance. And it went into the um, Jamuna lake. And the Nagapatnis, they found that jewel and they put it with their treasure box. So again, they presented this beautiful Kastuma money which is Krishna's original jewel. They presented that again to him. And then Krishna was so beautifully decorated and ornamented and massaged and oiled, etc. And then he sent Kaliya away to back to Ramanaka. And at that time it's described immediately, as soon as he departed, by Krishna's potency, immediately all the vegetation came back to life. And immediately 
that poisonous lake was purified instantly. There was no lingering time period. And when Krishna came out, now this part is just heart-wrenching. When Krishna came out, Mother Yashoda could not let him go. Tears were just flowing and flowing and flowing. Mother Rohini, all the elder gopas, gopis. And then it's described how Nanda Baba, even though it was just a crowd of women around Krishna initially, he forced him, him, himself through the crowd of women to be with Krishna, took him and put him on his lap. And Baladev also came and took from Nanda Baba and put on his lap and just couldn't stop looking at Krishna with unblinking eyes, just looking again. And, and they were all looking at all of his body. Is there any marks? That, that he, has he suffered any injury in this tremendous fight with Kaliya? And they were so concerned. The overwhelming mood that's described by the Acharyas at this time shows the reason for these pastimes to demonstrate to us the sweetness and heart of the Vrijvasis, the absolute purity of their affection and love for Krishna. So, this overwhelming mood was there, and then the Vrijvasis decided that actually now it has become late. Let's all stay on the bank of the Jamuna for the night. Vrijvasis are very free, liberal people. They travel all the way through brunch, like we've described very easy for their whole village just to spend the night on the bank of the Jamuna. So they moved to another spot, it's described, a beautiful clean spot, away from where they were, and they spent the night there. And I'm just going to very briefly describe the next demon, which is a forest fire that comes during this night, because it's more or less linked with this pastime. So this demon came in the form of a forest fire. It's described as the first forest fire. And this demon comes and circle, you know, what he calls this, and circles all of the bridge buses with scorching flames. This demon is described as a friend of Pralamba, uh, of, of Devakusura, who was killed just recently. This, this demon, and it's also described as someone who was sent by Kamsa. Remember the other day I was saying how Kamsa has all his spies out all the time. They're all seeing what's happening. Just like when Krishna was swallowed by Agasura, Kamsa was overjoyed when he heard that Krishna was wrapped up in the coils of Kaliya. And all the demons were rejoicing, but not for long. So Kamsa, he also sent this demon. And then... Um, And then um, they cried for Krishna to save them from this forest fire. And it's described why they wanted to save their lives. This is how Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur described. They wanted to save their lives because they would be separated from Krishna. That's what they were thinking. If we get consumed in this forest fire, we will be separated from Krishna. That is our fear. Not the fear of the fire for their own material safety, but the fear of being separated from Krishna. It's always this powerful thread of affection that is constant throughout this Madhurya um, world that we're entering here. So when Krishna hears their cries, and they also cried for Baladev at that point. Did you have a question just now? Yeah, it's the same night? The yes, same night. the same night. The same night. The same night in the day Kali was killed, and then the evening time they moved to the beautiful bank of the Jamuna for the evening, and then they spend the evening telling beautiful pastimes, and they all take rest. And when they rest around midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, then this blazing forest fire is sent by Kamsa, or is a friend of Dehukasura, come to devour them and kill them. They want revenge for what has actually happened. And then Krishna is described with his Samharika Shakti. It's not Krishna who's actually going to swallow this forest fire. He tells all the um, Rijvasis to close their eyes. And at this point, just like he tells the Sakas to close their eyes when he consumes the second forest fire, he tells them all to, uh, to close their eyes, and then very quickly, 
he consumes that forest fire by his Sarika Shakti. This is the name of his different Shakti. The Acharyas are very careful to describe all these different Shaktis of Krishna. Krishna doesn't have one or two or three or ten or twenty. He has hundreds, thousands of Shaktis, different energies acting in different ways. He has principal potencies, but he also has these individual Shaktis. They're all personalities. So this personality that had the capability of consuming a whole forest fire manifested and immediately consumed that fire. And then the Krishnasis were so much again relieved and again rejoicing in their strength of this remarkable child that was living in their community. And then it's described the next morning they went back and they all had previously the day before prepared all this wonderful feast for Baladev. So they just had to reheat it more or less, you know, and they added to that feast, and they had wonderful prasad when they actually returned. So this created great festivity in the village of Brunch, and great heart movements in the village of Brunch. These are what the pastimes are all showing, they're enacting this. How else uh, is Krishna going to encourage us to come to this land of Gokul, the spiritual world? What is the nature of spiritual consciousness? We're practicing so much sadhana, but what is its purpose? Its purpose is to come into this sweet atmosphere by memory, by smaranam. So we're hearing, and then I'm encouraging you all very much to tell these pastimes, talk about them, find some interesting topic amongst the pastime to actually discuss or speak about. <coughs> Some aspects that the Acharyas have described to give us points of conversation about the topics. Gurudev would give his classes like this. I can remember many times Gurudev would give a class and we'd spend the whole day talking about this particular aspect or that particular aspect or this or that or what he said this and that, trying to understand like that. He was trying to inspire us to carry this state of consciousness into our everyday reality. Because this is really Krishna conscious. So this is the purpose of these Madhurya sweet pastimes, is to soften our hard hearts and bring us to an appreciation of the absolute loving nature of Krishna. And all the bridge Vasis are reflecting that love. Love has to be two. You can't just have one love, it has to be two. There has to, it's relationship. So here we have this relationship, bridge Vasis and Krishna. And ultimately, of course, we're going to reach the most special relationship of the gopis. But at this time, the acharyas described, this is the first time that the gopis had actually seen Krishna dance like this. This was like the um, first time that Purvarak had really manifested. So it's a very significant pastime in the relationship between Krishna and the gopis. So I'll stop there. According to Bhakti Vinod, what, what show oh. the forest fire and also Kaliya? Yes, good. Thank you. I should see this each time. So, Kaliya represents brutal cruelty, maliciousness, pride, envy, a snake-like crookedness, particularly like likes to pour poison into the hearts of innocent Vaishnavas. What? Likes to pour poison into the hearts of innocent Vaishnavas. Do you know anyone like that? Have you met anyone like that? No. We don't know those people. If we're feeling someone is trying to influence me towards a critical mentality, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And we want to move away. So this is someone who's trying to pour this poison of criticism or brutality or maliciousness into a Vaishnava heart, which Krishna cannot tolerate, so he kills them. So this is how Bhakti Nautapu described it. also describes in uh, Gaga Samhita that in his last life in Swayambhuva Manu's Manvatara, that's the first one, he was um, a sage named Veda Sira, who was cursed for not allowing sage Ashvasira to meditate in his ashram. And Ash Basira cursed him, you are angry for no reason, you hiss like a snake, become a snake. 
And but the Lord Vishnu will appear and he will pay, place his feet on your heads in the future. So then Kaliya appeared in the first generation of the great snakes coming from the uh, daughter of Daksha, Kadru, who was the brother of Garuda, who I've already described in that part. So that, and now this second forest fire is very interesting, we'll speak for a long time, but there's no time left. It represents hatred and arguments between Vaishnavas or different religions and disrespecting each other's deities or Ishtadev. That is what it represents. It can also represent a type of clash, any type of clash or conflict. Sanatana Goswami says, some think the fire was a friend of Kaliya, others say it was Kamsa. So some think it was, also it's described by another chari that they think it was a friend of Dengu Basura. So Kaliya has no relation with Kamsa, it is different kind of demon. You have not been sent by Kamsa. Kaliya was still defeated by Kamsa. Kamsa knew all the demons. It's described in Gaga Samhita, I said, uh, Samhita, I said in the first day, that Kaliya, uh, Kamsa is the biggest demon because he defeats all of these demons, including Kaliya. He defeats him, except Putra. So Kaliya is defeated and Kaliya gets the green light from Kamsa to come into the lake. It is this Kamsa's territory. So such a great demon has to have the sanction of the master of the demons in that area, that's Kamsa. So Kamsa knew of Kaliya's place. Kamsa was hoping that Kaliya would kill Krishna just as and Kaliya knew what was Kamsa's desire and also was happy to kill Krishna to please Kamsa. It's a whole society of demons are there. there councils and so on. There's many times actually later on when Kamsa calls his remaining council of demons, you know, how they should deal with different situations. So, okay, any other question? Does the fire demon have a name because he was a personality? No, I don't have that. I didn't get that. You can inquire. You can look on Google. <laughs> it might say. I looked on Google this morning and so much about um, Kadru. And Kashyapa Muni, I thought, how could Kashyapa Muni have two wives? I thought Adita and Aditya were the wives of Kashyapa Muni. And it's saying, no, no, he had actually many, many, many wives. Thirteen of his wives were just the daughters of Daksha. What to speak of all the other wives also? So he had many wives, producing many types of personalities. So uh, Kashyapa is a son born from the uh, body of, doesn't have a mother, etc., born from Lord Brahma. Or it's saying he's a grandson of Marichi. So different explanations there. Okay, Kaliya Naga, Lila Ki Jaya. Shabra Kendra Nanda Ki Jaya. There'll be one more class on the demons of Radhama next Thursday. Will be our final. So many, we're not going to finish. Can you send me an email? I'll have it straight away directly. Just stay very well.